Hello everybody, I'm Gwen Campbell Mendes, welcome to Gwen's Bookish Ramblings, and I'm talking about The Legend of Nightfall by Mickey Zucker Reichart, uh, who is an author about whom I know nothing. Um, this is one of those books that you wind up picking up off the shelf because you say, huh, that looks like it could be interesting, and then you read the back and you say, yeah, yeah, okay, I'll do that one. Um, this is actually exactly what small libraries are best for, uh, is having a collection that's small enough for you to not sort of feel like you have to keep going because there's so much there that you should really just look until you find the right thing. When you've got a limited number of books, you'll find yourself picking things you might not otherwise pick, uh, but at the same time, having a collection means you have the chance to browse a little and sort of see what's there, and small libraries tend to have more eclectic collections. Anyways, so I wound up with The Legend of Nightfall, um, and this is an author who I had seen on the shelf fairly frequently and just never bothered to pick one up. You know, you you look at things, you make your choices about what you're going to read, you say, oh, there's an author that I know I like, so I'll take that book first, because you know you like this author, and if you're looking for something to read, why pick something by an author that you don't know in place of an author that you do know? Uh, but I picked this one up, and I enjoyed it, and now, years and years later, I kind of was just noodling around looking for something to read on the bus, and I said, oh, hey, that. I remember I liked that. So uh, I picked it up and read it on the bus, and now it's on the channel. So The Legend of Nightfall is based on the premise that this lead, the so-called titular character who throughout the book thinks of himself in the name of Nightfall, what he's basically, what he is, is a young man, he was born in unfortunate, problematic circumstances. His mother was a prostitute and abusive. And so as children who are born in abusive, poverty-stricken families, he didn't exactly turn out the best. But he found himself with one very, very good friend who basically managed to instill enough morals and ethics in him uh, often by dint of what you could consider to be pragmatism, that is, there's no need to, you know, be awful to everyone around you if you're nice and do them favors. People will be nice and do you favors later, keep that in mind. Um, that kind of thing, which is a sort of a moral and ethical framework based as much on pragmatism as anything else. Um, but anyways, what happened, though, was he was in a very bad situation, and he got out of it by becoming, among other things, an assassin. He's sort of, he's a killer, he's a thief, and but also he has, you know, dozens of alternate personas across the several countries that he travels around in. And nobody knows who he really is. Uh, and the book basically opens with him being captured and arrested, and when he is brought before, and when he is captured and arrested, he winds up assuming that the woman that he has been in a relationship with betrayed him, uh, because she, that he has his old friend, who he 110% believes would never betray him, and you have the uh, young woman, uh, Kelrin, I believe is her name. I'm terrible with names in real life, never mind in fiction. Uh, and he, uh, he assumes that she had to have betrayed him because, well, frankly, he's basically asking how else would these people have known about him? How else would these people have known, you know to, would they would have known who he was and would have known to associate the persona he was traveling under with him. And uh, the only person who had the means or opportunity to betray him, he feels, is Kelrin. 
Uh, so a goodly portion of this book is spent on him thinking vengeful thoughts about her. But the most interesting part of this book is its centerpiece, which is that what happens is the king's chief advisor is a sorcerer, and sorcerers in this particular fantasy reality are basically bad people. Because we're dealing with this with the kind of reality that has some people are born with magical talents, kind of like the X-Men. That is, Nightfall has a magical talent that allows him to physically change the his body's mass that is not not how much not how much like physical space he takes up, but how much he weighs. So he can make himself incredibly light or he can make himself very, very heavy, allowing him, for example, to be uh, unthrowable during a fight that, you know, a person expects him, expects to be able to judo throw him and they can't because he's suddenly 800 pounds. Um, you know, if he wants his horse to run faster, he can reduce the amount of weight that he weighs on the horse, allowing the horse to run as if it didn't have a rider on its back. Something that he actually does during the course of the book. You know, it allows him to be able to climb better because, again, he can make himself weigh less, allowing him to climb up without affecting, you know, without having to hoist the full bodily weight of a, an adult human being. And so it's, it's a very useful talent. Um, but there are, you know, we see a healer in this book. It turns out by the end of the book, we find out his old friend was a sort of a mind reader. Sorcerers are universally evil because what sorcerers do is they go around and they are people who find somebody with a magical talent and then they basically rip the person's soul out of their body and use that to basically absorb that person's talent and use it as if it were their own. And sorcerers usually wind up with a collection of these. And so the king trusts this sorcerer because he apparently doesn't understand what sorcerers actually do, something we get chapter and verse about from Nightfall's perspective. Um, and this sorcerer basically does what, you know, in some places you would call a gage bind. Basically, he casts a spell so that Nightfall is physically incapable of harming the king or the king's sons or any official of this particular court and binds him to the task of getting Prince the second... There are two princes. There's the older one and then there's the younger one. Prince Edward goes by Ned. Um, and getting him effectively landed outside of the kingdom because the king has the sense to realize that he can't give his younger son any sort of land or, you know, split the kingdom. Um, there are ways of dealing with this, but the big problem with Ned is that poor Ned is naive. Uh, we're talking an incredibly hopeless naivete that, that when you first read this book is just remarkable. That this is a young man who, you know, at first it's just sort of the standard foolish optimism thing when he storms up to his father and says, how can you make treaties with these people? They are slave owners and the king who, you know, he's the leader of a nation. He has to deal with the fact that this other nation is on his border and they have to make arrangements. Otherwise, this nation will, you know, potentially go to war or run roughshod over his borders, and so he needs to have these agreements in place. And it doesn't matter what moral or ethical issues there are with slavery, he doesn't control this other kingdom, and he has to think about the safety and functionality of his own, of his own lands. Uh, Ned doesn't have the pragmatism to understand this. Ned marches up to that particular guy's slaves uh, because while slavery is not legal where they are, they don't really have much of an ability to just, you know, free any slave that crosses their border because that would just cause a war with the country next door. 
And he just marches up and he's like, ha ha, you are now free. And the slaves are just baffled by this because, no, you can't just walk up to them and say, ha ha, I declare you to be free. It doesn't work that way. And Edward is so officious and, and self-righteous that he winds up killing somebody from this other country as part of his sort of haha I am so right I mean he regrets it and and a whole bunch of other things afterwards but he's basically just causing international incidents because he doesn't understand how to deal with the institution of slavery in any way shape or form he just sort of thinks that he can walk up to people and fling his arms open and everybody will just do it the the moment that you really realize how foolish and naive he is is when he comes storming into a formal court occasion with a poor man who looks way more embarrassed and concerned about the situation than the prince does declaring father did you know there are hungry people in your country and then points at this man dalrin here is hungry we need to feed him and his father's just like i can't i can't even deal with you and nightfall has basically been assigned to bodyguard and get this young man who is determined to save the world one crusade at a time to get him landed and functional and and he spends the whole book grimly dealing with all of this young man's worst excesses because he has no pragmatic worldview. He has no sense of pragmatism about anything. You know, when that that what it takes is things like Nightfall inventing stories to tell the prince like just made up stories about slaves and why slaves stay with their slavers and why some people would maybe even choose to stay in slavery and he points out that some people would do that because otherwise they're on the streets being preyed upon but at least if they are in indentured servitude they know that they have their guaranteed meals a day and a safe place to sleep and don't have to fight and claw on the street for survival and edward has never even realized this you have these moments where edward is walking around and he says oh that's a storage shed and and nightfall is forced to tell him no that's somebody's home and you know where are the children what are those children doing is it a game no they're working well where are their parents they're also working everybody's working they're poor everybody in the family works when you're poor and just these constant you know endless pushing to make him be sensible about things um and the thing is though that the big thing that this does for nightfall is it puts nightfall through the revelation that not everybody is awful because of course he had this one friend that he trusts and kelrin who he thought betrayed him it turns out she didn't that's plot twist near the end of the book but um the thing about edward is that edward is genuine and honest and well-meaning and will never strike his servants and so on and so forth and eventually nightfall comes to have a great deal of affection for his master despite the fact that he has been magically bound to him because edward is a well-meaning boob and he's not dumb he's just naive and it's a wonderfully interesting story of these two trend the, the two of them go on this character arc that changes who both of them are and it's really just it's a good fun read with a really solid two-person character arc that happens in there um and you know a decent surprise twist near the end or at least somewhat surprising probably not that surprising uh but i'm really bad at predicting these things uh anyways um so yeah i like this book
Lots of fun. As good as I remembered. So that's everything, and I will see you all next week.